Welcome back to the Buddhist Bookshelf YouTube channel. Today, we will resume our reading of The Sarlis Flower, authored by Ngoc Tran, known as Dharma Name Thien Phuc, and this is episode number 35. 475. The Supreme State of Enlightenment. In Buddhism, the supreme state of enlightenment is called Bodhi. Bodhi is the highest state of samadhi in which the mind is awakened and illuminated. The term bodhi is derived from the Sanskrit root bud, meaning knowledge understanding or perfect wisdom. A term that is often translated as enlightenment by Western translators, but which literally means awakening. Like the term Buddha, it is derived from the Sanskrit root bud, to wake up, and in Buddhism, it indicates that a person has awakened from the sleep of ignorance, in which most beings spend their lives. According to Buddhist legend, the Buddha attained Bodhi in the town of Bidgaya, while sitting in meditation under the Bodhi tree or Bodhi Vriksa. Bodhi means Margar the Way, according to old translation. However, according to new translation, Bodhi means to be aware, or to perceive, Sambodhi skt. Bodhi also means perfect wisdom, or the state of Bodhi, illuminated or enlightened mind. According to the Avadamsaka Sutra, Bodhi, enlightenment, belongs to living beings. Without living beings, no Bodhisattva could achieve supreme, perfect enlightenment. Bodhi also means Anatara Samyak Sambodhi, or the supreme enlightenment, or the full form of enlightenment of a Buddha. The supreme enlightenment realized by the Buddha, or the perfect universal enlightenment. The word Bodhi also means perfect wisdom or transcendental wisdom or supreme enlightenment. Bodhi is the state of truth or the spiritual condition of a Buddha or Bodhisattva. The cause of Bodhi is Prajna, wisdom, and Karuna, compassion. According to the Hinayana, Bodhi is equated with the perfection of insight into and realization of the Four Noble Truths, which means the cessation of suffering. According to the Mahayana, Bodhi is mainly understood as enlightened wisdom. Bajanga is a Pali term for factors of enlightenment. There are three kinds of Bodhi. The enlightenment of Sravakas, the enlightenment of Pratika Buddhas, and the enlightenment of Buddhas. There are also three other kinds of Bodhi. Bodhi mind to act out one's vows to save all living beings, Bodhi mind which is beyond description, and which surpasses mere earthly ideas, and Samadhi Bodhi mind. There are five Bodhi or stages of enlightenment. First, resolve on supreme Bodhi. Second, mind control, the passions and observance of the Paramitas. Third, mental enlightenment, study and increase in knowledge and in the Prajaparamitas. Fourth, mental expansion, freedom from the limitations of reincarnation and attainment of complete knowledge. Fifth, attainment of a passionless condition and of supreme perfect enlightenment. 476. Four kinds of pure precepts. In the Surangama Sutra, the Buddha gave four clear instructions on purity as follows. Any Buddhist practitioner must put an end to one's lust, killing, stealing and lying. In fact, these four four of the five basic precepts for lay Buddhists, but any Buddhists who can keep these four precepts can be called sincere Buddhists. However, the offenses may be considered serious for monks and nuns. The worst offenses grouped under the heading Parajika which entail the expulsion of the guilty from the community of monks and nuns. The word Parajika is derived from the Sanskrit root para and jika, which means that makes defeat. Four Parajikas mean four causes of falling from grace and final excommunication or expulsion of a monk or nun. According to the monastic point of view, these offenses are regarded as very serious in nature. Any monks, regardless of their ranks and years in the order, violate any one of these offenses, are subject to expulsion from the order. Once they are expelled, they are never allowed to join the order again. They are defeated forever. Therefore, the Buddha cautioned all monks and nuns not to indulge in any one of them. These four precepts are closely related. If you break the precept against the lust, it is easy to break the precept against killing, stealing and lying as well. In the same manner, if you break the precept against stealing, it is easy to break the precept against lying, etc. Therefore, the Buddha reminded Buddhists to cut off these four killing stealing lust lying. First, cutting off killing. 
if living beings in the six paths of any mundane world had no thoughts of killing, they would not have to follow a continual succession of births and deaths. According to the Tsurangama Sutra, the Buddha reminded Ananda about cutting off killing, one of the four important precepts for monks and nuns in Buddhism. Ananda. If living beings in the six paths of any mundane world had no thoughts of killing, they would not have to follow a continual succession of births and deaths. Ananda. Your basic purpose in cultivating samadhi is to transcend the wearisome defilements. But if you do not remove your thoughts of killing, you will not be able to get out of the dust. Ananda. Even though one may have some wisdom and the manifestation of Zen Samadhi, one is certain to enter the path of spirits if one does not cease killing. At best, a person will become a mighty ghost, on the average, one will become a flying yaksha, a ghost leader, or the like, at the lowest level, one will become an earthbound rakshasa. These ghosts and spirits have their groups of disciples. Each says of himself that he has accomplished the unsurpassed way. After my extinction, in the Dharma ending age, these hordes of ghosts and spirits will abode, spreading like wildfire as they argue that eating meat will bring one to the Bodhi way. Ananda. I permit the bhikshas to eat five kinds of pure meat. This meat is actually a transformation brought into being by my spiritual powers. It basically has no life force. You Brahmins live in a climate so hot and humid, and on such sandy and rocky land, that vegetables will not grow. Therefore, I have had to assist you with spiritual powers and compassion. Because of the magnitude of this kindness and compassion, what you eat that tastes like meat is merely said to be meat, in fact, however, it is not. After my extinction, how can those who eat the flesh of living beings be called the disciples of Sakya? You should know that these people who eat meat may gain some awareness and may seem to be in samadhi, but they are all great rakshasas. When their retribution ends, they are bound to sink into the biter sea of birth and death. They are not disciples of the Buddha. Such people as they kill and eat one another in a never-ending cycle. How can such people transcend a triple realm? Ananda. When you teach people in the world to cultivate samadhi, they must also cut off killing. This is the second clear and unalterable instruction on purity given by the thus come ones and the Buddhas of the past, world honored ones. Therefore, Ananda, if cultivators of Zen Samadhi do not cut off killing, they are like one who stops up his ears and calls out in a loud voice, expecting no one to hear him. It is to wish to hide what is completely evident. Bhikshas and Bodhisattvas who practice purity will not even step on grass in the pathway even less will they pull it up with their hand. How can one with great compassion pick up the flesh and blood of living beings and proceed to eat his will? Bhikshas who do not wear silk, leather boots, furs, or down from this country or consume milk, cream, or butter, can truly transcend this world. When they have paid back their past debts, they will not have to re-enter the triple realm. Why? It is because when one wears something taken from a living creature, one creates conditions with it, just as when people eat the hundred grains, their feet cannot leave the earth. Both physically and mentally one must avoid the bodies and the by-products of living beings by neither wearing them nor eating them. I say that such people have true liberation. What I have said here is the Buddha's teaching. Any explanation counter to it is the teaching of Papian. Second, cutting off stealing. According to the Surangama Sutra, the Buddha reminded Ananda about cutting off stealing, one of the four important precepts for monks and nuns in Buddhism. Ananda. If living beings in the six paths of any mundane world had no thoughts of stealing, they would not have to follow a continuous succession of births and deaths. Ananda. Your basic purpose in cultivating samadhi is to transcend the wearisome defilements. But if you do not, Renounce your thoughts of stealing, you will not be able to get out of the dust. Ananda. Even though one may have some wisdom and the manifestation of Zen Samadhi, one is certain to enter a devious path if one does not cease stealing. At best, one will be an apparition, on the average, one will become a phantom, at the lowest level, one will be a devious person who is possessed by a May ghost. These devious hordes have their groups of disciples. 
each says of himself that he has accomplished the unsurpassed way. After my extinction, in the Dharma ending age, these phantoms and apparitions will abound, spreading like wildfire as they surreptitiously cheat others. Calling themselves good knowing advisors, they will each say that they have attained the superhuman dharmas. Enticing and deceiving the ignorant, or frightening them out of their wits, they disrupt and lay watts to households wherever they go. I teach the bhikshas to beg for their food in an assigned place, in order to help them renounce greed and accomplish the bodhi way. The bhikshas do not prepare their own food, so that, at the end of this life of transitory existence in the triple realm, they can show themselves to be once returners who go and do not come back. How can thieves who put on my robes and sell the thus come one's dharmas, saying that all manner of karma one creates is just the budded dharma? They slander those who have left the home life and regard bhikshas who have taken complete precepts as belonging to the path of this small vehicle. Because of such doubts and misjudgments, limitless living beings fall into the unintermittent hell. I say that bhikshas who after my extinction have decisive resolve to cultivate samadhi, and who before the images of thus come ones can burn a candle on their bodies, or burn off a finger, or burn even one incense stick on their bodies, will in that moment repay their debts from beginningless time past. They can depart from the world and forever be free of outflows. Though they may not have instantly understood the unsurpassed enlightenment, they will already have firmly set their mind on it. If one does not practice any of these token renunciations of the body on the causal level, then even if one realizes the unconditioned, one will still have to come back as a person to repay one's past debts, exactly as I had to undergo the retribution of having to eat the grain meant for horses. Ananda. When you teach people in the world to cultivate samadhi, they must also see stealing. This is the third clear and unalterable instruction on purity given by the thus come one and the Buddhas of the past, world honored ones. Therefore, Ananda, if cultivators of Zen samadhi do not see stealing, they are like someone who pours water into a leaking cup and hopes to fill it. He may continue for as many eons as there are fine motes of dust but it still will not be full in the end. If bhikshas do not store away anything but their robes and bowls, if they give what is left over from their food offerings to hungry living beings, if they put their palms together and make obeisance to the entire great assembly, if when people scold them they can treat it as praise, if they can sacrifice their very bodies and minds, giving their flesh, bones, and blood to living creatures, if they do not repeat the non-ultimate teachings of the thus come one, as though they were their own explanations, misrepresenting them to those who have just begun to study, then the Buddha gives them his zeal as having attained true samadhi. What I have said here is the Buddha's teaching. Any explanation counter to it is the teaching of Papian. Third, cutting off lust. If living beings in the six paths of any mundane world had no thoughts of lust, they would not have to follow a continual succession of births and deaths. According to the Surangama Sutra, the Buddha reminded Ananda about cutting off lust, one of the four important precepts for monks and nuns in Buddhism. Ananda. Your. Basic purpose in cultivating is to transcend the wearisome defilements. But if you don't renounce your lustful thoughts, you will not be able to get out of the dust. Even though one may have some wisdom and the manifestation of Zen Samadhi, one is certain to enter demonic paths if one does not cut off lust. At best, one will be a demon king, on the average, one will be in the retinue of demons, at the lowest level, one will be a female demon. These demons have their groups of disciples. Each says of himself he has accomplished the unsurpassed way. After my extinction, in the Dharma ending age, these hordes of demons will abound, spreading like wildfire as they openly practice greed and lust. Coming to be good knowing advisors, they will cause living beings to fall into the pit of love and views, and lose the way to body. Ananda. When you teach people in the world to cultivate samadhi, they must first of all sever the mind of lust. This is the first clear and unalterable instruction on purity given by the thus come ones and the Buddhas of the past, world honored ones. Therefore, Ananda, if cultivators of Zen Samadhi do not cut off lust, they will be like someone who cooks sand in the hope of getting rice, 
after hundreds of thousands of eons, it will still be just hot sand. Why? It wasn't rice to begin with, it was only sand. Ananda. If you seek the Buddha's wonderful fruition and still have physical lust, then even if you attain a wonderful awakening, it will be based in lust. With lust at the source, you will revolve in the three paths and not be able to get out. Which road will you take to cultivate and be certified to the thus come one's nirvana? You must cut off the lust which is intrinsic in both body and mind. Then get rid of even the aspect of cutting it off. At that point you have some hope of attaining the Buddha's body. What I have said here is the Buddha's teaching. Any explanation counter to it is the teaching of Papian. Fourth, cutting off false speech. According to the Surangama Sutra, the Buddha reminded Ananda about cutting off false speech, one of the four important precepts for monks and nuns in Buddhism. Ananda. Though living beings in the six paths of any mundane world may not kill, steal, or lust either physically or mentally, these three aspects of their conducts thus being perfect, yet if they tell lies, the samadhi they attain will not be pure. They will become demons of love and views, and will lose the seed of the thus come one. They say that they have attained what they have not attained, and what they have been certified when they have not been certified, perhaps they seek to be foremost in the world, the most venerated and superior person. To their audiences they say that they have attained the fruition of a Shraddhapana, the fruition of a Sacradagaman, the fruition of an Anagaman, the fruition of an Arat, the Pratika Buddha vehicle, or the various levels of bodhisattvahood up to and including the ten grounds, in order to be revered by others, and because they are greedy for offerings. These akantikas destroy the seeds of Buddhahood, just as surely as a tala tree is destroyed. The Buddha predicts that such people sever, cut off, their good roots forever, and lose their knowledge and vision. Immersed in the sea of the three sufferings, they cannot attain samadhi. I command the bodhisattvas and arats to appear after my extinction in response bodies in the Dharma ending age, and to take various forms in order to rescue those in the cycle of rebirth. They should either become shramanas, elite robed lay people, kings, ministers or officials, virgin youths or maidens, and so forth, even prostitutes, widows, profligates, thieves, butchers, or dealers in contraband, doing the same things as these kinds of people, while they praise the Buddha vehicle and cause them to enter samadhi in body and mind. But they should never say of themselves, I am truly a bodhisattva or I am truly an arat or let the Buddha's secret cause leak out by speaking casually to those who have not yet studied. How can people who make such claims, other than at the end of their lives and then only to those who inherit the teaching, be doing anything but deluding and confusing living beings and indulging in a gross false claims? Ananda. When you teach people in the world to cultivate samadhi, they must also cease all lying. This is the fourth clear and unalterable instruction on purity given by the thus come ones and the Buddhas of the past, world honored ones. Therefore, Ananda, one who does not cut off lying, is like a person who carves a piece of human excrement to look like Chandana, hoping to make it fragrant. He is attempting the impossible. I teach the bhikshus that the straight mind is the bodhimanda, and that they should practice the four awesome deportments in all their activities. Since they should be devoid of all falseness, how can they claim to have themselves attained the dharmas of a superior person? That would be like a poor person falsely calling himself an emperor, for that, he would be taken and executed. Much less should one attempt to usurp the title of Dharma king. When the cause ground is not true, the effects will be distorted. One who seeks the Buddha's body in this way is like a person who tries to bite his own navel. Who could possibly succeed? If bhikshus's minds are as straight as lute strings, true and real in everything they do, then they can enter samadhi and never be involved in the deeds of demons. I certify that such people will accomplish the bodhisattva's unsurpassed knowledge and enlightenment. What I have said here is the Buddha's teaching. Any explanation counter to it is the teaching of Papian. 477. The Four Right Efforts. According to the Sanjiti Sutta in the Long Discourses of the Buddha, there are eight occasions for making an effort. Here a monk who has a job to do. He thinks. 
I've got this job to do, but in doing it I won't find easy to pay attention to the teaching of the Buddhas. I'll have to stir up my energy. And he stirs up sufficient energy to complete the uncompleted, to accomplish the unaccomplished, to realize the unrealized. Here a monk who has done some work and thinks. Well, I did the job, but because of it, I wasn't able to pay sufficient attention to the teaching of the Buddhas. So I will stir up sufficient energy. And he stirs up sufficient energy to complete the uncompleted, to accomplish the unaccomplished, to realize the unrealized. Here a monk who has to go on a journey and thinks. I have to go on this journey, but in doing it, I won't find easy to pay attention to the teaching of the Buddhas. I'll have to stir up energy. And he stirs up sufficient energy to complete the uncompleted, to accomplish the unaccomplished, to realize the unrealized. Here a monk who has been on a journey, and he thinks. I have been on a journey, but because of it I wasn't able to pay. Sufficient attention to the teaching of the Buddhas. I'll have to stir up energy. And he stirs up energy to complete the uncompleted, to accomplish the unaccomplished, to realize the unrealized. Here a monk who goes for alms round in a village or town and does not get his fill of food, whether coarse or fine, and he thinks. I've gone for alms round without getting my fill of food. So my body is light and fit. I'll stir up energy. And he stirs up energy to complete the uncompleted, to accomplish the unaccomplished, to realize the unrealized. Here a monk who goes for alms round in a village or town and gets his fill of food, whether coarse or fine, and he thinks. I have gone for alms round and get my fill of food. So my body is strong and fit. I'll stir up energy. And he stirs up energy to complete the uncompleted, to accomplish the unaccomplished, to realize the unrealized. Here a monk who has some slight indisposition, and he thinks. I get some slight indisposition, and this indisposition might get worse, so I'll stir up energy. And he stirs up energy to complete the uncompleted, to accomplish the unaccomplished, to realize the unrealized. Here a monk who is recuperating from an illness, and he thinks. I am just recuperating from an illness. It might be that the illness will recur. So I'll stir up energy. And he stirs up energy to complete the uncompleted, to accomplish the unaccomplished, to realize the unrealized. However, in the 37 limbs of enlightenment the Buddha taught about the four kinds of right effort or restrain, or four essentials to be practiced vigilantly. A Sanskrit term for effort. Right effort of four kinds of restraint, or four essentials to be practiced vigilantly, or four factors that are developed through meditation and moral training. First, endeavor to start performing good deeds, effort to initiate virtues not yet arisen. Bringing forth goodness not yet brought forth, bring good into existence. To induce the doing of good deeds. Here a practitioner rouses his will, makes an effort, stirs up energy, exerts his mind, and strives to produce unarisen wholesome mental states. Second, endeavor to perform more good deeds, effort to consolidate, increase and not deteriorate virtues already arisen. Developing goodness that has already arisen, develop existing good. To increase merit when it was already produced. To encourage the growth and continuance of good deeds that have already started. Here a practitioner rouses his will, makes an effort, stirs up energy, exerts his mind, and strives to maintain wholesome mental states that have arisen, not to let them fade away, to bring them to greater growth to the full perfection of development. Third, endeavor to prevent evil from forming, effort not to initiate sins not yet arisen, or preventing evil that hasn't arisen from arising, or to prevent any evil from starting or arising. To prevent emirat from arising. Here a practitioner rouses his will, makes an effort, stirs up energy, exerts his mind, and strives to prevent the arising of unarisen evil unwholesome mental states. Fourth, Endeavor to eliminate already formed evil, effort to eliminate sins already arisen. Putting an end to existing evil or to abandon demerit when it arises or to remove any evil as soon as it starts. Here a practitioner rouses his will, makes an effort, stirs up energy, exerts his mind, and strives to overcome evil unwholesome mental states that have arisen. 478. Bodhisattva's Salvation of Sentient Beings. 
According to the Vimalakirti Sutra, when Manjusri Bodhisattva called to inquire after Vimalakirti's health, Vimalakirti told Manjusri about saving sentient beings. Manjusri asked, What should a Bodhisattva wipe out in order to liberate living beings? Vimalakirti replied, when liberating living beings, a bodhisattva should first wipe out their klesa, troubles and causes of troubles? Manjusri asked. What should he do to wipe out klesa? Vimalakirti replied. He should uphold right mindfulness. Manjusri asked. What should he do to uphold right mindfulness? Vimalakirti replied. He should advocate the unborn and the undying. Manjusri asked. What is the unborn and what is the undying? Vimalakirti replied. The unborn is evil that does not arise, and the undying is good that does not end. Manjusri asked. What is the root of good and evil? Vimalakirti replied. The body is the root of good and evil. Manjusri asked. What is the root of the body? Vimalakirti replied. Craving is the root of the body. Manjusri asked. What is the root of craving? Vimalakirti replied. Baseless discrimination is the root of craving. Manjusri asked. What is the root of baseless discrimination? Vimalakirti replied. Inverted thinking is the root of discrimination. Manjusri asked. What is the root of inverted thinking? Vimalakirti replied. Non-abiding is the root of inverted thinking. Manjusri asked. What is the root of non-abiding? Vimalakirti replied. Non-abiding is rootless. Manjusri, from this non-abiding root all things arise. 479. Bodhisattvas save all sentient beings. According to the Buddha in the Flower Adornment Sutra, Chapter 25, 10 Dedications, enlightening beings save other sentient beings without any mental image of sentient beings, enlightening beings think that first, they may use these roots of goodness universally to benefit all sentient beings, causing them to be purified, to reach the ultimate shore. And to forever leave the innumerable pains and afflictions of the realms of hells, hungry ghosts, animals and asuras, titans. When the great enlightening beings plant these roots of goodness, they dedicate their one roots of goodness thus. I should be a hostile for all sentient beings, to let them escape from all painful things. I should be a protector for all sentient beings, to let them all be liberated from all afflictions. I should be a refuge for all sentient beings, to free them from all fears. I should be a goal for all sentient beings, to cause them to reach universal knowledge. I should make a resting place for all sentient beings, to enable them to find a place of peace and security. I should be a light for all sentient beings, to enable them to attain the light of knowledge to annihilate the darkness of ignorance. I should be a torch for all sentient beings, to destroy all darkness of nations. I should be a lamp for all sentient beings, to cause them to abide in the realm of ultimate purity. I should be a guide for all sentient beings, to lead them into the truth. I should be a great leader for all sentient beings, to give them great knowledge. Great enlightening beings dedicate all foundations of goodness in this way, to equally benefit all sentient beings, and ultimately cause them all to attain universal knowledge. Enlightening beings' protection of and dedication to those who are not their relatives or friends are equal to those for their relatives and friends. Enlightening beings enter the equal nature of all things, they do not conceive a single thought of not being relatives or friends. Even if there be sentient beings who have malicious or hostile intentions toward the enlightening beings, still the enlightening beings also regard them with the eye of compassion and are never angered. Fourth, Enlightened beings are good friends to all sentient beings. They always explain the right teaching for sentient beings, so that they may learn and practice it. Fifth, enlightening beings dedicate because they are just as the ocean which cannot be changed or destroyed by all poisons. The various oppressive afflictions of all the ignorant, the unwise, the ungrateful, the wrathful, those poisoned by covetousness, the arrogant and conceited, the mentally blind and deaf, those who do not know what is good, and other such evil sentient beings, cannot disturb the enlightening beings, they are just as the sun, appearing in the world not concealed because those who are born blind do not see it, 
not hidden by the obstruction of such things as mirages, eclipses, trees, high mountains, deep ravines, dust, mist, smoke, or clouds, not concealed by the change of seasons. Enlightening beings dedicate with great virtues, with deep and broad minds. They dedicate because they want ultimate virtue and knowledge, their minds aspire to the supreme truth, the light of truth illumines everywhere, and they perceive the meanings of everything. Their knowledge freely commands all avenues of teaching, and in order to benefit all sentient beings they always practice virtuous ways, never mistakenly conceiving the idea of abandoning sentient beings. Sixth, enlightening beings do not reject sentient beings and fail to cultivate dedication because of the meanness of character of sentient beings or because their erroneous will, ill will and confusion are hard to quell. Seventh, enlightening beings just array themselves with the armor of great vows of enlightening beings, saving sentient beings without ever retreating. Eighth, enlightening beings do not withdraw from enlightening activity and abandon the path of enlightenment just because sentient beings are ungrateful. Ninth, enlightening beings do not get sick of sentient beings just because ignoramuses altogether give up all the foundations of goodness which accord with reality. Tenth, enlightening beings do not retreat because sentient beings repeatedly commit excesses and evils which are hard to bear. Eleventh, great enlightening beings do not cultivate roots of goodness and dedicate them to complete perfect enlightenment just for the sake of one sentient being. It is in order to save and safeguard all sentient beings everywhere that they cultivate roots of goodness and dedicate them to unexcelled complete perfect enlightenment. Twelfth, it is not purified just one Buddha land, not because of belief in just one Buddha, not just to see one Buddha, not just to comprehend one doctrine that they initiate the determination for great knowledge and dedicate it to unexcelled complete perfect enlightenment. It is to purify all Buddha lands, out of faith in all Buddhas, to serve all Buddhas, to understand all Buddha teachings, that they initiate great vows, cultivate the foundations of goodness, and dedicate them to unexcelled complete perfect enlightenment. Thirteenth, enlightening beings vow that. By my roots of goodness, may all creatures, all sentient beings, be purified, may they be filled with virtues which cannot be ruined and are inexhaustible. May they always gain respect. May they have right mindfulness and unfailing recollection. May they attain sure discernment. May they be replete with immeasurable knowledge. May all virtues of physical, verbal and mental action fully adorn them. Fourteenth, Bodhisattvas use these roots of goodness to cause all sentient beings to serve all Buddhas, to their unfailing benefit, to cause all sentient beings pure faith to be indestructible to cause all sentient beings to hear the true teaching, cut off all doubt and confusion. Remember the teaching without forgetting it, to cause all sentient beings to cultivate in accord with the teaching, to cause sentient beings to develop respect for the enlightened, to cause sentient beings to act with purity, to rest securely on innumerable great foundations of goodness, to cause all sentient beings to be forever free from poverty to cause all sentient beings to be fully equipped with the seven kinds of wealth, faith, vigor, shame, learning, generosity, concentration and wisdom, to cause all sentient beings to always learn from the Buddha, to perfect innumerable roots of goodness, to cause sentient beings to attain impartial understanding, to abide in omniscience, to look upon all sentient beings equally with unobstructed eyes, to adorn their bodies with all marks of greatness, without any flaws, beautiful voices, replete with all fine qualities, to have control over their senses, to accomplish the ten powers, to be filled with goodwill, to dwell or depend on nothing, to cause all sentient beings to attain the enjoyments of Buddhahood and abide in the abode of Buddhas. Fifteenth, seeing sentient beings doing all sorts of bad things and suffering all sorts of misery and pain, and being hindered by this from seeing the Buddha, hearing the teaching and recognizing the community, the enlightening beings vow to enter those states of woe. Take on the various miseries in place of the sentient beings to cause them to be free. Sixteenth, enlightening beings suffer pain in this way, but they are not discouraged. In the contrary, they vigorously cultivate without ceasing because they are determined to carry all sentient beings to liberation.
They are determined to save all sentient beings and to enable them to attain emancipation so that they can be free from the realm of pain and troubles of birth, old age, sickness, and death. They are determined to save all sentient beings from revolving in erroneous views, bereft of qualities of goodness. They are determined to save all sentient beings who are wrapped up in the web of attachments, covered by the shroud of ignorance, clinging to all existence, pursuing them unceasingly, entering the cage of suffering, acting like maniacs, totally void of virtue or knowledge, always doubtful and confused, do not perceive the place of peace, do not know the path of emancipation, revolve in birth and death without rest, and always submerged in the mire of suffering. 17. Enlightening beings are not seeking liberation for themselves, but they want to use what they practice to cause all sentient beings become supreme sovereign of knowledge, attain the omniscient mind, cross over the flow of birth and death, and be free from all suffering. 18. Enlightening beings vow to accept all sufferings for the sake of all sentient beings and enable them to escape from the abyss of immeasurable woes of birth and death. 19. Enlightening beings always vow to accept all sufferings for the sake of all sentient beings in all worlds, in all states of misery forever, but still always cultivate foundations of goodness for the sake of all beings. 20. Enlightening beings vow that they would rather take all their sufferings on themselves than allow sentient beings to fall into hell, animal, hungry ghost, and asura realms. 21st, enlightening beings vow to protect all sentient beings and never abandon them. This is a sincere vow because they set their mind on enlightenment in order to liberate all sentient beings, not seeking the unexcelled way for their own sake. 22nd, enlightening beings do not cultivate enlightening practice in search of pleasure or enjoyment. Why? Because mundane pleasures are all sufferings and mundane pleasures are the realms of maniacs only craved by ignorant people, but scorned by Buddhas because all misery arises from them. The anger, fighting, mutual defamation and such evils of the realms of hells, ghosts, animals and asuras, are all caused by greedy attachment to objects of desire. By addiction to desires, one become estranged from the Buddhas and hindered from birth in heaven, to say nothing of unexcelled complete perfect enlightenment. 23rd Enlightening beings vow to dedicate roots of goodness to enable all sentient beings to attain ultimate bliss, beneficial bliss, the bliss of non-reception, the bliss of dispassionate tranquility, the bliss of imperturbability, immeasurable bliss, the bliss of not rejecting birth and death, yet not regressing from nirvana, undying bliss, and the bliss of universal knowledge. 24th for all sentient beings, enlightening beings vow to be a charioteer, to be a leader, to be holding the torch of great knowledge and showing the way to safety and peace, freeing them from danger, to use appropriate means to inform sentient beings of the truth. In the ocean of birth and death, they are skillful captains of the ship who know how to deliver sentient beings to the other shore. 25th Enlightening beings dedicate all their roots of goodness and save sentient beings by employing means appropriate to the situation to cause them to emerge from birth and death, to serve and provide for all the Buddhas, to attain unhindered omniscient knowledge, to abandon all maniacs and bad associates, to approach all enlightening beings and good associates, to annihilate all error and wrongdoing, to perfect pure behavior and to fulfill the great practical vows and innumerable virtues of enlightening beings. 26th Sentient beings cannot save themselves, how can they save others? Only enlightening beings have this unique determination of cultivating a mass roots of goodness and dedicate them in this way to liberate all sentient beings, to illumine all sentient beings, to guide all sentient beings, to enlighten all sentient beings, to watch over and attend to all sentient beings, to take care of all sentient beings, to perfect all sentient beings, to gladden all sentient beings, to bring happiness to all sentient beings, and to cause all sentient beings to become freed from doubt. 27th Enlightening beings' dedication should be like the sun shining universally on all without seeking thanks or reward, not abandoning all sentient beings because one sentient being is evil. Just diligently practicing the dedications of roots of goodness to cause all sentient beings to attain peace and ease.
enlightening beings are able to take care of all sentient beings even if they are bad, never giving up their vows on this account. Even if their roots of goodness be few, but because they want to embrace all sentient beings, so they always make a great dedication with a joyful heart. If one has roots of goodness but does not desire to benefit all sentient beings, that is not called dedication. When every single root of goodness is directed toward all sentient beings, that is called dedication. 28. Enlightening beings cultivate dedication to place sentient beings in the true nature of things where there is no attachment. 29. Enlightening beings cultivate dedication to see that the intrinsic nature of sentient beings doesn't move or change. 30. Enlightening beings cultivate dedication without depending on or grasping dedication. 31. Enlightening beings cultivate dedication without attachment to the appearances of roots of goodness. 32. Enlightening beings cultivate dedication without false ideas about essential nature of consequences of actions. 33. Enlightening beings cultivate dedication without attachment to the characteristics of the five clusters of material and mental existence. 34. Enlightening beings cultivate dedication without destroying the characteristics of the five clusters. 35. Enlightening beings cultivate dedication without grasping action. 36. Enlightening beings cultivate dedication without seeking reward. 37. Enlightening beings cultivate dedication without attachment to causality. 38. Enlightening beings cultivate dedication without imagining what is producing by causality. 39. Enlightening beings cultivate dedication without attachment to reputation. 40. Enlightening beings cultivate dedication without attachment to location. 41. Enlightening beings cultivate dedication without attachment to unreal things. 42. Enlightening beings cultivate dedication without attachment to images of sentient beings, the world, or mind. 43. Enlightening beings cultivate dedication without creating delusions of mind, delusions of concepts, or delusions of views. 44. Enlightening beings cultivate dedication without attachment to verbal expression. 45. Enlightening beings cultivate dedication observing the true nature of all things. 46. Enlightening beings cultivate dedication observing the aspects in which all sentient beings are equal. 47. Enlightening beings cultivate dedication stamping all roots of goodness with the seal of the realm of truth. 48. Enlightening beings cultivate dedication observing all things dispassionately, they understand that all things have no propagation, and that roots of goodness are also thus. 49. Enlightening beings cultivate dedication observing that things are non-dual, unborn, and unperishing. 50. Enlightening beings use such roots of goodness to cultivate and practice pure methods of curing spiritual ills. 51. All of their roots of goodness are in accord with transcendental principles, but they do not conceive of them dualistically. 52. It is not in their deeds that they cultivate omniscience. 53. Enlightening beings cultivate omniscience, but it is not apart from deeds that they cultivate omniscience. Omniscience is not identical to action, but omniscience is not attained apart from action either. Because their action is pure as light, the consequences are also pure as light, because the consequences are pure as light, omniscience is also pure as light. They detach from all confusions and thoughts of self and possession, enlightening beings skillfully cultivate dedication of all roots of goodness. 54. Enlightening beings cultivate dedication in this way to liberate sentient beings ceaselessly, they do not dwell on appearances. Though they know that in all things there is no action and no consequences, yet they can skillfully produce all deeds and consequences without opposition or contention. Enlightening beings cultivate dedication, free from all faults, and are praised by all Buddhas. 480. Salvation. Salvation may be understood as the deliverance of someone from destruction, sufferings, afflictions, and so on, and to bring that person to the state of being safe from destructive forces, natural or supernatural. To other religions, salvation means deliverance from sin and death, and admission to a so-called eternal paradise. These are religions of deliverance because they give promise of some form of deliverance. 
they believe that a person's will is important, but grace is more necessary and important to salvation. Those who wish to be saved must believe that they see a supernatural salvation of an almighty creator in their lives. In Buddhism, the concept of salvation is strange to all sincere Buddhists. One time, the Buddha told his disciples, The only reason I have come into the world is to teach others. However, one very important thing is that you should never accept what I say is true, simply because I have said it. Rather, you should test the teachings yourselves to see if they are true or not. If you find that they are true and helpful, then practice them. But do not do so merely are of respect for me. You are your own savior, and no one else can do that for you. One other time, the Buddha gently patted the crazy elephant and turned to tell Ananda. The only way to destroy hatred is with love. Hatred cannot be defeated with more hatred. This is a very important lesson to learn. Before Nirvana, the Buddha himself advised his disciples. When I am gone, let my teachings be your guide. If you have understood them in your heart, you have no more need of me. Remember what I have taught you. Craving and desire are the cause of all sufferings and afflictions. Everything sooner or later must change, so do not become attached to anything. Instead devote yourselves to clearing your minds and finding true and lasting happiness. These are the Buddha's golden speeches on some of the concepts of salvation. In salvation, Mahayana Buddhism has temporary manifestation for saving, coverting and transporting beings. It is difficult for ordinary people like us to understand the teaching with infinite compassion of Buddhas and Bodhisattvas. Sometimes, they use as their speech to preach the Dharma, but a lot of times they use their way of life, such as retreating in peace, strictly following the precepts to show and inspire others to cultivate the way. Temporary manifestation for saving beings means temporarily appear to save sentient beings. The power of Buddhas and Bodhisattvas to transform themselves into any kind of temporal body in order to aid beings. Salvation includes converting and transporting, to teach and save, to rescue and teach. To transform other beings. The region, condition, or environment of Buddha instruction or conversion. Salvation also means any land which a Buddha is converting, or one in which the transformed body of a Buddha. These lands are of two kinds. Pure like to see to heaven and vile or unclean like this world. Tiantai defines the transformation realm of Amitabha as the pure land of the West. Other schools speak of the transformation realm as the realm on which depends the Nirmanakaya. According to Tao Cho, 562-645, one of the foremost devotees of the Pure Land School, in his book of Peace and Happiness, one of the principal sources of the Pure Land Doctrine. All the Buddhas save sentient beings in four ways. First, by oral teaching such recorded in the twelve divisions of Buddhist literature. Second, by their physical features of supernatural beauty. Third, by their wonderful powers and virtues and transformations. Fourth, by recitating of their names, which when uttered by beings, will remove obstacles and result their rebirth in the presence of the Buddha. 481. Break the false and make manifest the right. Buddhas and Bodhisattvas save all sentient beings by breaking, disproving, the false and making manifest the right. According to the Madhyamaka school, the doctrine of the school has three main aspects, the first aspect is the refutation itself of a wrong view, at the same time, the elucidation of a right view. Refutation is necessary to save all sentient beings who are drowned in the sea of attachment, while elucidation is also important in order to propagate the teaching of the Buddha. First, refutation of all wrong views. Refutation means to refute all views based on attachment. Also views such as the self or atman, the theory of Brahmanic philosophers. The pluralistic doctrines of the Buddhist Abhidharma schools, Vabhasika, Kosa, etc., and the dogmatic principles of Mahayana teachers, are never passed without a detailed refutation. The realistic or all exists, and the nihilistic or nothing exists are equally condemned. Second, elucidation of a right view. According to Prof. Takakusu in the Essentials of Buddhist Philosophy, the Madhyamaka school strongly believed that the truth can be attained only by negation or refutation of wrong views within and without Buddhism, 
and of errors of both the great and small vehicles. When retaining, how can a blind man get a right view without which the two extremes can never be avoided? The end of verbal refutation is the dawn of the middle path. Refutation and refutation only can lead to the ultimate truth. The middle path, which is devoid of name and character, is really the way of elucidation of a right view. 482. Different categories of repentance. There are two modes of repentance. Buddhists should not commit offenses. On the contrary, we should create more merit and virtue to offset the offenses that we committed before. However, if we commit offenses, we should repent, for once repented, great offenses will be eradicated. There are two kinds of repentance. First, unintentional offenses. What should devout Buddhists repent? We should tell all of our offenses in front of the fourfold assembly and vow not to repeat those offenses again. To be able to do this, Buddhas and Bodhisattvas will support and help us eradicate our karmas, for our offenses from before were all committed unintentionally. Second, intentional offenses. If we already vowed to repent and we still deliberately commit the same offense again, repentance will not help. Our act will become fixed karma, and in the future we will definitely receive the retribution. Devout Buddhists should not think that if we create offenses, we can simply repent to eradicate these offenses, and so keep on creating more offenses, while continuously vowing to repent. In the future, the offenses accumulated will be as high as Mount Meru. This way, there is no way we can avoid falling into hells. There are also three modes of repentance. The first mode of repentance is to meditate to prevent wrong thoughts and delusions that hinder the truth. The second mode of repentance is to seek the presence of the Buddha to rid one of sinful thoughts and passions. To hold repentance before the mind until the sign of Buddha's presence annihilates the sin. The third mode of repentance is to confess one's breach of the rules before the Buddha and seek remission in proper form. The five stages in a penitential service in Tian Tai sect. First, confess of past sins and forbidding them for the future. Second, appeal to the universal Buddhas to keep the law wheel rolling. Third, rejoicing over the good in self and others. Fourth, offering all one's goodness to all the living and to the Buddha way. The fifth mode of repentance is to vow to become a Buddha by doing all good deeds, avoiding all bad deeds, purifying the mind in bestowal of acquired merits or resolve to observe and practice the four universal vows, magnanimous vows. According to the Shingon sect, there are five stages in a penitential service. Shingon sect divides the ten great vows of the universal good bodhisattva, Samantabhadra, into five stages of penitential service. Submission, worship and respect all Buddhas, praise the thus come ones, make abundant offerings, and repent misdeeds and mental hindrances or karmic obstacles. There are also seven mental attitudes in penitential meditation or worship. First, shame for not yet being free from mortality. Second, fear of the pains of hells. Third, turning from the evil world. Fourth, desire for renunciation and enlightenment. Fifth, impartiality in love to all. Sixth, gratitude to the Buddha. Seventh, meditation on the unreality of the sin nature, that sin arises from perversion, and that it has no real existence. 483. Repentance of the Three Major Classes. In the Lotus Sutra, the Buddha taught about repentance of the three major classes. First, repentance of sravakas. Suppose that a sravaka breaks the threefold refuge, the five precepts, the eight precepts, the precepts of bhikshas, of bhikshanas, of sramanaras, of sramanarikas, and of sikshamanas, and their dignified behavior, and also suppose that because of his foolishness, evil, and bad and false mind he infringes many precepts and the rules of dignified behavior. If he desires to rid himself of and destroy these errors, to become a bhikshu again and to fulfill the laws of monks, he must diligently read the all the Vipulya sutras, sutras of great extent, considering the profound law of the void of the first principle, and must bring this wisdom of the void to his heart. Know that in each one of his thoughts, such a one will gradually end the defilement of all his long-standing sins without any remainder. This is called one who is perfect in the laws and precepts of monks and fulfills their dignified behavior. 
such a one will be deserved to be served by all gods and men. Second, repentance of an upasaka. Suppose any upasaka violates his dignified behavior and does bad things. To do bad things means, namely, to proclaim the error and sins of the Buddha laws, to discuss evil things perpetrated by the four groups, and not to feel shamed even in committing theft and adultery. If he desires to repent and rid himself of these sins, he must zealously read and recite the Vipulya Sutras and must think of the first principle. Third, repentance of Kshatriyas, Mandarins, and other citizens. Suppose a king, a minister, a Brahmin, and other citizens, an elder, a state official, all of these persons seek greedily and untiringly after desires, commit the five deadly sins, slander the, the Vipulya Sutras, and perform the ten evil karma. Their recompense for these great evils will cause them to fall into evil paths faster than the breaking of a rainstorm. They will be sure to fall into the Avisi hell. If they desire to rid themselves of and destroy these impediments of karmas, they must raise shame and repent all their sins. There are five ways of repentance for these people. First, they want to rid themselves of karmas, they must constantly have the right mind not slander the three treasures, nor hinder the monks nor persecute anyone practicing Brahma conduct. They must support, pay homage to, and surely salute the keeper of the great vehicle, they must remember the profound doctrine of sutras and the void of the first principle. Second, they must discharge their filial duty to their fathers and mothers, and to respect their teachers and seniors. Third, they must rule their countries with the righteous law, and not to oppress their people unjustly. Fourth, they must issue within their states the ordinance of the sixth day of fasting, and to cause their people to abstain from killing wherever their powers reach. Fifth, they must believe deeply the causes and results of things, to have faith in the way of one reality, and to know that the Buddha is never extinct. 484. 10 Profound Theories. In order to elucidate the possibility of the realm of fact and fact world perfectly harmonized the Huayan school set forth the ten profound theories. First, the theory of correlation, in which all things have coexistence and simultaneous rise. All are coexistent not only in relation to space, but also in relation to time. There is no distinction of past, present and future, each of them being inclusive of the other distinct as they are and separated as they seem to be in time, all beings are united to make over entity from the universal point of view. Second, the theory of perfect freedom in which all beings broad and narrow commune with each other without any obstacle. The power of all beings is two. Intention and extension is equally limitless. One action, however small, includes all actions. One and all are commutable freely and uninterruptedly. Third, the theory of mutual penetration of dissimilar things. All dissimilar existences have something in common. Many in one, one in many, and all in unity. Fourth, the theory of freedom, i.e., freedom from ultimate distinctions, in which all elements are mutually identified. It is a universal identification of all beings. Mutual identification is, in fact, self-negation. Identifying oneself with another, one can synthesize with another. Negating oneself and identifying oneself with another constitutes synthetical identification. This is a peculiar theory or practice of Mahayana. It is applied to any theory in practice. Two opposed theories or incompatible facts are often identified. Often a happy solution of a question is arrived at by the use of this method. As the result of mutual penetration and mutual identification, we have the concept one in all, all in one. One behind all, all behind one. The great and small, the high or low, moving harmoniously together. Even the humblest partaking of the work in peace, no one stands separately or independently alone. It is the world of perfect harmony. Fifth, the theory of complementarity by which the hidden and the manifested will make the whole by mutual supply. If one is inside, the other will be outside, or vice versa. Both complementing each other will complete one entity. Sixth, the theory of construction by mutual penetration of minute and abstruse matters. Generally speaking, the more minute or abstruse a thing is, the more difficult it is to be conceived. 
things minute or abstruse beyond a man's comprehension, must also be realizing the theory of one and many and many in one. Seventh, the theory of interreflection, as in the region surrounded by the Indra net, a net decorated with a bright stone on each knot of the mesh, where the jewels reflect brilliance upon each other, according to which the real facts of the world are mutually permeating and reflecting. Eighth, the theory of elucidating the truth by factual illustrations. Truth is manifested in fact, and fact is the source of enlightening. Ninth, the theory of variously completing ten time periods creating one entity. Each of past, present and future contains three periods, thus making up nine periods which altogether form one period, nine and one, ten periods in all. The ten periods, all distinct yet mutually penetrating, will complete the one in all principle. All other theories are concerned chiefly with the mutual penetration in horizontal plane, but this theory is concerned with the vertical connection or time, meaning that all beings separated along the nine periods, each complete in itself, are, after all, interconnected in one period, the one period formed by the nine. Tenth, the theory of completion of virtues by which the chief and the retinue work together harmoniously and brightly. If one is the chief, all others will work as his retinue, i.e., according to the one and all and all in one principle, they really form one complete whole, penetrating one another. 485. Kusala Dharmas. Kusala means volitional action that is done in accordance with the Aryan Eightfold Noble Path. So, Kusala is not only in accordance with the right action, but it is also always in accordance with the right view, right understanding, right speech, right livelihood, right energy, right concentration and right samadhi. According to the Dharmapada Sutra, verse 183, the Buddha taught not to do evil, to do good, to purify one's mind, this is the teaching of the Buddhas. Kusala karmas or good deeds will help a person control a lot of troubles arising from his mind. Inversely, if a person does evil deeds he will receive bad results in this life and the next existence which are suffering. Thus, wholesome deeds clean our mind and give happiness to oneself and others. Kusala means good, right, wholesome. It is contrary to the unwholesome dot according to Buddhism, Kusala karma means volitional action that is done in accordance with the Aryan Eightfold Noble Path. So, Kusala karma is not only in accordance with the right action, but it is also always in accordance with the right view, right understanding, right speech, right livelihood, right energy, right concentration and right samadhi. According to the Dharmapada Sutra, verse 183, the Buddha taught not to do evil, to do good, to purify one's mind, this is the teaching of the Buddhas. Kusala karmas or good deeds will help a person control a lot of troubles arising from his mind. Inversely, if a person does evil deeds he will receive bad results in this life and the next existence which are suffering. An honest man, especially one who believes in Buddhist ideas of causality and lives a good life. There are two classes of people in this life, those who are inclined to quarrel and addicted to dispute, and those who are bent to living in harmony and happy in friendliness. The first class can be classified wicked, ignorant and heedless folk. The second class comprised of good, wise and heedful people. The Buddha has made a clear distinction between wickedness and goodness, and advises all his disciples not to do evil actions, to perform good ones and to purify their own heart. He know that it is easy to do evil action. To perform meritorious one far more difficult. But his disciples should know how to select in between evil and good, because wicked people will go to hell and undergo untold suffering, while good ones will go to heaven and enjoy peaceful bliss. Moreover, good one even from a far shrine like the mountain of snow with their meritorious actions, while bad ones are enveloped in darkness like an arrow shot in the night. According to the Connected Discourses of the Buddha, Chapter Ambapali, there are two starting points of wholesome states. First, virtue that is well purified which includes basing upon virtue and establishing upon virtue. Second, view that is straight. According to the long discourses of the Buddha, there are three good, wholesome, roots. For monks and nuns, there are the wholesome roots of non-greed, non-hatred, and non-delusion, 
no selfish desire, no ire, no stupidity, the wholesome roots of almsgiving, kindness, and wisdom, and the wholesome roots of good deeds, good words, good thoughts. Three good roots for all moral development. The wholesome root of no lust or selfish desire, the wholesome root of no ire or no hatred, and the wholesome root of no stupidity. For ordinary people, there are three wholesome roots. The wholesome root of almsgiving, the wholesome root of mercy, and the wholesome root of wisdom. There are also three good upward directions or states of existence. The first path is the wholesome path. This is the highest class of goodness rewarded with the Deva life. The second path is the path of human beings. The middle class of godness with a return to human life. The third path is the path of asuras. The inferior class of goodness with the asura state. According to the long discourses of the Buddha, Sanjiti Sutra, there are three kinds of wholesome element. First, the wholesome element of renunciation. Second, the wholesome element of non-enmity. Third, the wholesome element of non-cruelty. According to the long discourses of the Buddha, there are three kinds of right conduct. Right conduct in body, right conduct in speech, and right conduct in thought. Three good deeds, the foundation of all development, include no lust, no selfish desire, no anger, and no stupidity, no ignorance. According to the Abhidharma, there are three doors of wholesome kama pertaining to the sense sphere. First, bodily action pertaining to the door of the body. Not to kill, not to steal, and not to commit sexual misconduct. Second, verbal action pertaining to the door of speech. Not to have false speech, not to slander, not to speak harsh speech, and not to speak frivolous talk. Third, mental action pertaining to the door of the mind. Not to have covetousness, not to have ill will, and not to have wrong views. According to the long discourses of the Buddha, Sanjiti Sutra, there are three kinds of wholesome investigation. First, the wholesome investigation of renunciation. Second, the wholesome investigation of non-enmity. Third, the wholesome investigation of non-cruelty. According to the long discourses of the Buddha, Sanjiti Sutra, there are three kinds of wholesome perception. First, the wholesome perception of renunciation. Second, the wholesome perception of non-enmity. Third, the wholesome perception of non-cruelty. According to the Mahayana, there are four good roots, or sources from which spring good root or development. Srabakas, Pratika Buddhas, Bodhisattvas, and Buddhas. According to the Kosa sect, there are four good roots, or sources from which spring good fruit or development. The level of heat, the level of the summit, the level of patience, and the level of being first in the world. According to the Surangama Sutra, Book 8, there are four good roots, or sources from which spring good fruit or development. The Buddha reminded Ananda as follows. Ananda. When these good men have completely purified these forty-one minds, they further accomplish four kinds of wonderfully perfect additional practices. The first root is the level of heat. When the enlightenment of a Buddha is just about to become a function of his own mind, it is on the verge of emerging, but is not yet emerged, and so it can be compared to the point just before wood ignites when it is drilled to produce fire. Therefore, it is called the level of heat. The second route is the level of the summit. He continues on with his mind, treading where the Buddhas tread, as if relying and yet not. It is as if he were climbing a lofty mountain, to the point where his body is in space, but there remains a slight obstruction beneath him. Therefore it is called the level of the summit. The third route is the level of patience. When the mind and the Buddha are two and yet the same, he has well obtained a middle way. He is like someone who endures something when it seems impossible to either hold it in or let it out. Therefore it is called he level of patience. The fourth route is the level of being first in the world. When numbers are destroyed, there are no such designations as the middle way or as confusion and enlightenment, this is called the level of being first in the world. According to the long discourses of the Buddha, Sanjiti Sutra, there are eight right factors. Right views, right thinking, right speech, right action, right livelihood, right effort, right mindfulness, and right concentration. In the Dharmapada Sutra, the Buddha taught. 
as a flower that is colorful and beautiful, but without scent, even so fruitless is the well-spoken words of one who does not practice it, Dharmapada 51. As the flower that is colorful, beautiful, and full of scent, even so fruitful is the well-spoken words of one who practices it, Dharmapada 52. As from a heap of flowers many a garland is made, even so many good deeds should be done by one born to the mortal lot, Dharmapada 53. If a person does a meritorious deed, he should do it habitually, he should find pleasures therein, happiness is the outcome of merit, Dharmapada 118. Even a good person sees evil, as long as his good deed is not yet ripened, but when his good deed is ripened, then he sees the good results, Dharmapada 120. Do not disregard small good, saying, it will not matter to me. Even by the falling of drop by drop, a water jar is filled, likewise, the wise man, gathers his merit little by little, Dharmapada 122. In the 42 section Sutra, Chapter 14, the Buddha taught. A Sramana asked the Buddha. What is goodness? What is the foremost greatness? The Buddha replied. To practice the way and to protect the truth is goodness. To unite your will with the way is greatness. 486. Akusala Dharmas. Unwholesome deeds, anything connected with the unwholesome root or a castle amula, accompanied by greed, hate or delusion, and cause undesirable karmic results or future suffering. There are two kinds of causes in the world. Good causes and bad causes. If we create good causes, we will reap good results, if we create bad causes, we will surely reap bad results. According to the path of purification, unwholesome deeds are both unprofitable action and courses that lead to unhappy destinies. Unwholesome mind creates negative or unwholesome thoughts, anger, hatred, harmful thoughts, wrong views, etc., speech, lying, harsh speech, double-tongued, etc., as well as deeds which are the causes of our sufferings, confusion and misery. Unwholesome or negative mind will destroy our inner peace and tranquility. According to Buddhism, if we create bad causes, we will surely reap bad results. People who create many offenses and commit many transgressions will eventually have to undergo the retribution of being hell dwellers, hungry ghosts, and animals, etc. In general, doing good deeds allows us to ascend, while doing evil causes us to descend. In everything we do, we must take the responsibility ourselves, we cannot rely on others. According to the path of purification, bad ways is a term for doing what ought not to be done, and not doing what ought to be done, out of desire, hate, delusion, and fear. They are called bad ways because they are ways not to be traveled by noble ones. Incorrect conduct in thought, word or deed, which leads to evil recompense. Unwholesome speech or slanderous or evil speech which cause afflictions. In the Dharmapada Sutra, the Buddha taught. Do not speak unwholesome or harsh words to anyone. Those who are spoken to will respond in the same manner. Angry speech nourishes trouble. You will receive blows in exchange for blows, Dharmapada 133. If like a cracked gong, you silence yourself, you already have attained nirvana. No vindictiveness quarrels will be found in you, Dharmapada 134. Unwholesome views or wrong views mean seeing or understanding in a wrong or wicked and grasping manner. There are five kinds of wrong views. Wrong views of the body, one-sided views, wrong views which are inconsistent with the Dharma, wrong views caused by attachment to one's own erroneous understanding, and wrong views or wrong understandings of the precepts. Unwholesome deeds are bad, wrong, cruel, evil or mischievous acts. Unwholesome or wicked deeds which are against the right. Maliciousness is planning to harm others. It includes thinking how to revenge a wrong done to us, how to hurt others' feelings or how to embarrass them. From the earliest period, Buddhist thought has argued that immoral actions are the result of ignorance, avidya, which prompts beings to engage in actions, karma, that will have negative consequences for them. Thus evil for Buddhism is a second-order problem, which is eliminated when ignorance is overcome. Thus the definition of sin and evil is pragmatic. Evil actions are those that result in suffering, and whose consequences are perceived as painful for beings who experience them.
unwholesome or evil karmas of greed, hatred and ignorance, all created by body, mouth and speech. Unwholesome or harmful actions, or conduct in thought, word or deed, by the body, speech, and mind, to self and others, which leads to evil recompense, negative path, bad deeds, or black path. Unwholesome or negative karma includes greed, anger, ignorance, pride, doubt, wrong views, killing, stealing, sexual misconduct, and unwholesome thoughts. According to the Siglaka Sutra, there are four causes of unwholesome or evil actions. Unwholesome action springs from attachment, ill will, ignorance, and fear. According to the Siglaka Sutra, the Buddha taught. If the Aryan disciple does not act out of attachment, ill will, folly or fear, he will not do evil from any one of the four above mentioned causes. In the Dharmapada Sutra, the Buddha taught. As rust sprung from iron eats itself away when arisen, just like ill deeds lead the doer to a miserable state, Dharmapada 240. There are three kinds of unwholesome paths, the states of woe, realms of woe, evil realms, or evil ways. Also called evil ways are three evil paths, or destinies of hells, hungry ghosts and animals. These are three paths which can be taken as states of mind, i.e., when someone has a vicious thought of killing someone, he is effectively reborn, for that moment, in the hells. Sentient beings in evil realms do not encounter the butted dharma, never cultivate goodness, and always harm others. Sometimes the asura realm is also considered an unwholesome or evil realm, because though they have heavenly merits, they lack virtues and have much hatred. There are four fundamental unwholesome passions. These four are regarded as the fundamental evil passions originating from the view that there is really an eternal substance known as ego-soul. First, the belief in the existence of an ego-substance. Second, ignorance about the ego. Third, conceit about the ego. The fourth fundamental unwholesome passion is self-love. All karmas are controlled by the threefold deed, body, speech, and mind. Three deeds of the body, four deeds of the mouth and three deeds of the mind. According to Buddhism, evil phenomena refers to supernatural phenomena which are said to be side effects of zazen, such as clairvoyance and oath magical abilities, as well as hallucinations. They are considered to be distractions, and so meditators are taught to ignore them as much as possible, and to concentrate on meditative practice only. Akusala is a Sanskrit term for bonds of assumptions of bad states. These are obstructions of body, kavarana, and of mind, manasavarana. Some Buddhist exegetes also add the third type, obstructions of speech, vagavarana. These are said to be caused by influences of past karma, in imitation of past activities, and are the subtle traces that remain after the afflictions, klesa, have been destroyed. An example that is commonly given is of an arat, who has eliminated the afflictions, seeing a monkey and jumping up and down, while making noises like a monkey, but the subtle traces still remain deep in the conscious. According to Buddhism, an unwholesome person means an evil person, one who has evil ideas of the doctrine of voidness, to deny the doctrine of cause and effect. Thus, the Buddha advises us not make friends with wicked ones, but to associate only with good friends. He points out very clearly that if we yearn for life, we should avoid wickedness like we shun poison, because a hand free from wound can handle poison with impurity. The dhammas of the good ones do not decay, but go along with the good ones to where meritorious actions will lead them. Good actions will welcome the well-doer who has gone from this world to the next world, just as relatives welcome a dear one who has come back. So the problem poses itself very clear and definite. Wickedness and goodness are all done by oneself. Wickedness will lead to dispute and to war, while goodness will lead to harmony, to friendliness and to peace. Also according to the Buddhism, the unwholesome people are those who commit unbelievable crimes and whose minds are filled with greed, hatred and ignorance. Those who commit lying, gossip, harsh speech, and double-tongued. Those who abuse others' good heart, those who cheat others for their own benefits, those who kill, steal, those who act lasciviously, those who think of wicked plots, those who always think of wicked, evil, scheme. There are three unwholesome paths or three evil paths. Hells, 
hungry ghosts, and animals. Great Master Ying Kuang reminded Buddhist followers to single-mindedly recite the Buddha's name if they wish for their mind not to be attaching and wandering to the external world. Do not forget that death is lurking and hovering over us, it can strike us at any moment. If we do not wholeheartedly concentrate to practice Buddha recitation, praying to gain rebirth to the Western Pure Land, then if death should come suddenly, we are certain to be condemned to the three unwholesome realms where we must endure innumerable sufferings, and sometime infinite Buddhas have in turn appeared in the world. But we are still trapped in the evil paths and unable to find liberation. Thus, cultivators should always ponder the impermanence of a human life, while death could come at any moment without warning. We should always think that we have committed infinite and endless unwholesome karmas in our former life in this life, and the sufferings awaiting for us in the unwholesome realms. Upon thinking all these, we will be awakened in every moment, and we no longer have greed and lust for the pleasures of the five desires and six elements of the external world. If condemned to hell, then we will experience the torturous and agonizing conditions of a mountain of swords, a forest of knives, stoves, frying pans, in each day and night living and dying ten thousand times, the agony of pain and suffering is inconceivable. If condemned to the path of hungry ghost, then the body is hideously ugly reeking foul odors. Stomach as large as a drum, but neck is as small as a needle, though starving and thirsty, the offenders cannot eat or drink. When seeing food and drinks, these items transform into coals and fires. Thus, they must endure the torture and suffering of famine and thirst, throwing, banging their bodies against everything, crying out in pain and agony for tens and thousands of kalpas. If condemned to the animal realm, then they must endure the karmic consequences of carrying and pulling heavy loads, get slaughtered for food, or the strong prey on the weak, mind and body always paranoid, frightened and fearful of being eaten or killed, without having any moment of peace. There are five kinds of unwholesome deeds in this world. The first kinds of unwholesome deed is cruelty. Every creature, even insects, strives against one another. The strong attack the weak, the weak deceive the strong, everywhere there is fighting and cruelty. The second kinds of unwholesome deed is deception and lack of sincerity. There is a lack of a clear demarcation between the rights of a father and a son, between an elder brother and a younger, between a husband and a wife, between a senior relative and a younger. On every occasion, each one desires to be the highest and to profit off others. They cheat each other. They don't care about sincerity and trust. The third kinds of unwholesome deed is wicked behavior that leads to injustice and wickedness. There is a lack of a clear demarcation as to the behavior between men and women. Everyone at times has impure and less vicious thoughts and desires that lead them into questionable acts and disputes, fighting, injustice and wickedness. The fourth kinds of unwholesome deed is disrespect the rights of others. There is a tendency for people to disrespect the rights of others, to exaggerate their own importance at the expense of others, to set bad examples of behavior and, being unjust in their speech, to deceive, slander and abuse others. The fifth kinds of unwholesome deed is to neglect their duties. There is a tendency for people to neglect their duties towards others. They think too much of their own comfort and their own desires, they forget the favors they have received and cause annoyance to others that often passes into great injustice. According to the long discourses of the Buddha, Sanjiti Sutra, there are eight unwholesome factors. Wrong views, wrong thinking, wrong speech, wrong action, wrong livelihood, wrong effort, wrong mindfulness, and wrong concentration. Eight wrong perceptions of thought. Desire, hatred, vexation with others, homesickness, patriotism or thoughts of the country's welfare, dislike of death, ambition for one's clan or family and sliding or being rude to others. According to the Sanjiti Sutta in the Long Discourses of the Buddha, there are nine unwholesome causes of malice, which are stirred up by the thought there is no use to think that a person has harmed, is harming, or will harm either you, someone you love, or someone you hate. First, he has done me an injury. Second, he is doing me an injury. Third, he will do me an injury. Fourth, he has done an injury to someone who is dear and pleasant to me. Fifth, 
he is doing an injury to someone and pleasant to me. Sixth, he will do an injury to someone who is dear and pleasant to me. Seventh, he has done an injury to someone who is hateful and unpleasant to me. Eighth, he is doing an injury to someone who is hateful and unpleasant to me. Ninth, he will do an injury to someone who is hateful and unpleasant to me. Ancient virtues taught on unwholesome doings as followed. Those who spit at the sky, immediately the spit will fall back on their face. Or to harbor blood to spit at someone, the mouth is the first to suffer from filth. Five practical suggestions to prevent evil thoughts given by the Buddha. First, harboring a good thought opposite to the encroaching one, e.g., loving kindness in the case of hatred. Second, reflecting upon possible evil consequences, e.g., anger sometimes results in murder. Third, simple neglect or becoming wholly inattentive to them. Fourth, tracing the cause which led to the arising of the unwholesome thoughts and thus forgetting them in the retrospective process. Fifth, direct physical force. In the Dharmapada Sutra, the Buddha taught, let's hasten up to do good. Let's restrain our minds from evil thoughts, for the minds of those who are slow in doing good actions delight in evil, Dharmapada 116. If a person commits evil, let him not do it again and again, he should not rejoice therein, sorrow is the outcome of evil, Dharmapada 117. Even an evil doer sees good as long as evil deed is not yet ripened, but when his evil deed is ripened, then he sees the evil results, Dharmapada 119. Do not disregard, underestimate, small evil, saying, it will not matter to me. By the falling of drop by drop, a water jar is filled, likewise, the fool becomes full of evil, even if he gathers it little by little, Dharmapada 121. A merchant with great wealth but lacks of companions, avoids a dangerous route, just as one desiring to live avoids poison, one should shun evil things in the same manner, Dharmapada. 123. With a hand without wound, one can touch poison, the poison does not affect one who has no wound, nor is there ill for him who does no wrong. Dharmapada 124. Whoever harms a harmless person who is pure and guiltless, the evil falls back upon that fool, like dust thrown against the wind, Dharmapada 125. Some are born in a womb, evil doers are reborn in hells, the righteous people go to blissful states, the undefiled ones pass away into nirvana, Dharmapada 126. Neither in the sky, nor in mid-ocean, nor in mountain cave, nowhere on earth where one can escape from the consequences of his evil deeds, Dharmapada 127. The evil is done by oneself, it is self-born, it is self-nursed. Evil grinds the unwise as a diamond grinds a precious stone, Dharmapada 161. Bad deeds are easy to do, but they are harmful, not beneficial to oneself. On the contrary, it is very difficult to do that which is beneficial and good for oneself, Dharmapada 163. The foolish man who slanders the teachings of the Arats, of the righteous and the noble ones. He follows false doctrine, ripens like the cash to read, only for its own destruction, Dharmapada 164. By oneself the evil is done, by oneself one is defiled or purified. Purity or impurity depend on oneself. No one can purify another, Dharmapada 165. Not to slander, not to harm, but to restrain oneself in accordance with the fundamental moral codes, to be moderate in eating, to dwell in secluded abode, to meditate on higher thoughts, this is the teaching of the Buddhas, Dharmapada 185. In the 42 section Sutra, the Buddha taught. The Buddha said. When an evil person hears about virtue and intentionally or voluntarily comes to cause trouble, you should restrain yourself and should not become angry or upbraid him. Then, the one who has come to do evil will do evil to himself. There was one who, upon hearing that I protect the way and practice great humane compassion, intentionally or voluntarily came to scold me. I was silent and did not reply. When he finished scolding me, I asked, if you are courteous to people and they do not accept your courtesy, the courtesy returns to you, does it not? He replied, it does. I said, now you are scolding me, but I do not receive it. 
So, the misfortune returns to you and must remain with you. It is just as inevitable as the echo that follows a sound or as the shadow that follows a form. In the end, you cannot avoid it. Therefore, be careful not to do evil. An evil person who harms a sage is like one who raises his head and spits at heaven. Instead of reaching heaven, the spittle falls back on him. It is the same with one who throws dust into the wind instead of going somewhere else, the dust returns to fall on the thrower's body. The sage cannot be harmed, misdeed will inevitably destroy the doer. This is the end of this video. As you already know. Buddha emphasized the importance of generosity supporting the spread of the Dharma for spiritual growth, we can cultivate this virtue in our digital age. Now I need your help spreading the Buddha teaching further by subscribing, liking, and sharing our channel, you're supporting the dissemination of valuable teachings, much like the Sangha was supported in the past. Your engagement accumulates positive karma for you and helps make the Dharma accessible to a wider audience, a meritorious act indeed. Let's do this with pure intentions, free from attachment and selfishness, fostering a sense of community and supporting our own spiritual journey. These principles, rooted in Buddhist ethics, continue to guide us. You will receive great blessings for supporting the propagation of Buddha's teachings in a very simple way by subscribing, liking, and sharing to help spreading the Buddha teaching to all human beings. Wishing you and your family always have a peaceful and happy life.